Well, I'm here today to talk to you about chickens. <laughs> so most of you probably don't give a lot of thought to chickens or eggs or the fact that eggs become chickens. But this is actually a very amazing commodity. What I want to talk to you about is the last 100 years, where we are now, and let you think about where we might be in the next 100 years. So this story today really is the backstory about everything you wanted to know about chickens but really didn't know who to ask. <laughs> so let's start out with our key indicator of the strength of our relationship with poultry, and that would be consumption. And in the period between 1965 and 2000, we've more than doubled our intake of poultry meat. And by poultry meat in Alberta, I really mean chickens and turkeys. So if we go back 100 years before organized production, marketing, distribution of poultry, this is really what chickens look like. This Rhode Island red chicken was actually photographed on my grandmother's farm in Saskatchewan in the early 1900s. She was in the picture too, but I photoshopped her out. Because <laughs> this one's about chickens. So, this, no disrespect intended. But this chicken would have been expected to lay about 200 eggs in a year, and then probably sit on a few eggs and hatch about a dozen chicks in that year. And the way that new genetics came to that farm would be in the, in, in the form of rooster swapping, very much the way we swap bulls today. It would be like, here's, here's some new genetics. And the, the role that universities played in that would be to be a testing station, so farmers could submit their best hens or best roosters and be evaluated. And that way you could, you could market those birds. So the other interesting thing was, this was a dual purpose chicken. And so she was an egg type chicken for the first two years of her life, and then she became a meat type chicken. And that was really the life of a dual purpose chicken. So this image was taken in the fall of 1957, and these were Christmas turkeys that year. And I was a Christmas Eve baby that year. <laughs> taken by, and I was, this picture was taken by the person that delivered me into this world, and I'm talking a nurse. And that's why I know they were, that was the year they were. But these turkeys were interesting for several reasons compared to modern turkeys. One, they're darkly pigmented, where modern turkeys are white. These turkeys could fly onto a barn roof, where modern turkeys couldn't fly onto one of these chairs. And these turkeys are raised outdoors, and most turkeys aren't raised outdoors now. So the 1960s saw the start of the organized chicken industry. And when I was a kid in high school, I used to be a chicken catcher at night. I could carry seven chickens in each hand, load them on semi-trucks. Back then, we thought 8,000 chickens on a farm was a big farm. Um, on my own farm I grew up on, we had every year we'd get 100 chickens and we'd raise those for ourselves. And this is a picture of my younger sister Kathy holding chickens that today would be considered locally produced free range organic chickens. Back then they were considered a no frills cost effective way to feed a family of six. So current chicken production is almost entirely total confinement. And by total confinement I mean we are very dependent on electricity to run feeding systems, watering systems, ventilation, and we have time clocks and we have high levels of sanitation required. It's also very difficult to get into a building like this for you to see it firsthand, and that's really because producers have too much risk to have you come in and make their birds sick with something you're carrying on. So our industry is very well organized, and it's organized by lots of forces, and one of those forces is economic efficiency. So by economic efficiency, what I mean is they are tr really trying to feed the world well and effectively um, with a low-cost food product. About 1960, it became obvious that the chickens we use for eggs and the chickens we use for meat are genetically not very similar because we are developing into two markets. To the point that we don't even talk about chicken breeds anymore, we talk about crosses, and that means they're not, they're not true breeds. They're based on a white Cornish and a white Plymouth Rock. So we thought we have a supply chain where, we, where our genetics and, and product, products come and go. And that is, really starts with some very highly organized primary breeding companies. And I'll tell you later on how many of these are left, but there's not very many. They produce a genetic product every year, very much like a car company produces a new car product every year. And they ship these eggs to 30 hatching egg producers in Alberta. That's 3-0. Those hatching egg producers then take these hatching eggs and send them to one of three commercial hatcheries. Those three commercial hatcheries then hatch these male and female chicks and send them to one of 268 commercial broiler farms in Alberta, which in turn, at about 38 days of age, ship those birds to one of three processors. 
So there's no question that in terms of feeding the world efficiently, the poultry industry has done a good job of that. So you can see that from 1925, where it took about 110 days to produce a 2.2 kilo broiler. In 1965, we had that down to 62 days, and now we're down to 38 days. So that's, that's the same time required to produce one 2.2 um, kilo bird. And we haven't done this by force feeding birds. I mean, if you think about that, 40,000 birds in a barn force feeding them would take a long time, and then you have to start all over again, because food goes through a chicken really fast. So we don't do that. We also don't do it by feeding hormones, and we don't do it by injecting hormones, and we don't do it by taking genes out of turkeys and inserting them into chickens, and I've heard all those things. So what we've really done is, done is use classical genetics by selecting birds that have a big propensity to eat lots of feed, and then having those birds go into the next generation. And we do it very efficiently because in 1925, it took almost five units of feed to produce one unit of chicken meat. So now it takes less than 1.8. And some of the credit for this goes to the feed industry, some goes to the veterinary industry, but most of it goes to the animal breeders. So these chickens in front of you represent birds that are 1957, 77, and 2007. So the ones on the far left are, are the smallest. And the thing is, all these birds are the same age. All these birds are 55-day-old chickens. And you can see that in this time period, birds have got a little bit taller, but they've got a lot wider. And the reason they've got a lot wider is we have been selecting birds for breast muscle because we have a quest for white meat. So in doing so, we've gone from having chickens in 1957 that had a pointy keel to chickens nowadays that actually have fairly considerable cleavage. And so <laughs> along with that cleavage comes a change in their center of gravity where chickens are becoming more um, dense in the front half and so they, we have the pro potential problem of having birds tip over or walk poorly. And so this would be a real problem if we didn't check it, but the breeding industry now Particularly in turkeys, before a turkey male goes into the elite populations, he walks down a runway and judges with a scorecard, analyzes if he can walk well enough to go into the next generation. So one of the interesting things about North American chicken production is where it takes place. If you look at this picture, you would see that most of the broiler production in the U.S. takes place down in the southeast corner, where there is lots of corn, where there's a nice environment. And if you look up south of where we are, there's really no chickens at all. There's no broilers there, and the U.S. just produces them in the south and ships them all north. So if you looked at that, you'd probably guess and say, well, in Canada, they wouldn't have any chickens either. However, that's not quite the case. And the reason it's not the case is we use something called supply management in Canada since the 1970s, which really says that we are going to have lo some local production in the way that every province produces all of the chickens that they consume. So what it means is every province produces chicken, and um, we have that local production then, unlike what happens in, in North Dakota. So the second key part of supply <coughs> management is the price that a farmer's paid for chicken is based on true costs of production. So chicken farmers don't lose money like some other commodities do if they overproduce or underproduce, because of orderly marketing, we always make sure that the price that farmers are paid takes into account the cost of production. The third part is balancing supply and demand. We, have, we know we have difference in seasonal intake of chicken because we eat more chicken in the summer. But because of that, we place, farmers place more chickens down in the summer. And so we, we, ba we balance supply and demand. So in some parts of the world, um, chicken production is relatively low-tech. And in some of those places, it's low-tech because of poverty. And for example, I've been in South Africa where there's no electricity, no refrigeration, and a chicken really can be tethered into a little shantytown yard because that's the way they keep chicken until they want to consume chicken. So that chicken will be considered a free-range chicken, but not free-range by choice. It's free-range by um, poverty. In Canada, there is a growing trend for organic and free range among people who can afford it. But obviously, this is a seasonal market. This is Alberta. It did snow on the way down from Edmonton this morning. And there are, so there's some issues with potentially bad weather. There's issues 
potentially with predators, and also issues with potential health things, with wild birds flying over, dropping specialty products from above. <laughs> so speaking of specialty products, we have seen a few things happen that kind of surprised me. And I took this picture last, last fall in my local Safeway store of two Cornish game hens. If you look closer, they were on sale for $18.21, or a price of $9.46 per kilo. And this is where I really have to wonder if people know what they're buying. Because these sound like little fancy French hens, but they're not. They're the very same broader chickens you would buy at any time, only they're called Cornish game hens and they're small. So by marketing them early and charging a lot more for them, we can get more for them and call them Cornish game hens. Okay, beginning with Colonel Sanders in 1950, we've, chickens had a remarkable, remarkable fast food history. And so the Colonel basically took a whole chicken, which fed a family, chopped it in nine particular pieces and said, we have portions now. And that's, that led way to the whole, whole chicken fast food thing. Over time, we got chicken breast, chicken breast muscles marketed as nuggets and fingers. And if I, I've been asked lots of times by school kids, where are the nuggets on a chicken? <laughs> And I'd, I'd love to tell you about that today, but that's a whole other story. So, and you, but this product here is available in Alberta. And the key thing about it is, it's chicken you cook in your toaster. And I'm not talking in your, in your um, toaster oven or your microwave, but a pop-up toaster. And my kids like them. So anyway, so right after that fast food mo movement, we have a slow food movement. So this is something that is a response to preservatives and factory food mass production, and it really is a glamorous, romantic view of back in the times when we used to really cook food, and we used to actually maybe even grow the food we cooked. So it's a movement that has a small but loyal following, mostly in urban centers. And we have people who will actually help out with this kind of production in terms of growing chicken, but sometimes people think this food has a smaller carbon footprint because it's grown locally, but it may actually have a bigger carbon footprint because of the costs the energy costs of producing that locally in terms of, the, of building the right environment. So, which makes me, when we talk about slow food, the next thing on the horizon is chickens in your backyard. And a lot of cities now, you can apply to have chickens in your backyard. And what I really worry about though is, do we have the infrastructure in place to deal with it when a chicken breaks a wing or gets sick? Do you take it to your vet and have a, have a chicken put down for $165? <laughs> so, think about that one. Anyway, we also have, a lot of things going on with, with nutraceuticals and farming. And so we are now are, are putting biologically incorporating um, products into eggs and chicken meat. And this is something that we're gonna see a lot more. We've had omega-3 in eggs, we've had lutein in eggs, we've had vitamin in eggs, and now we're also getting that in meat as well. So like I said before, not long ago, you could go to a chicken farm and go in and actually see the birds. Nowadays, that's becoming very difficult or almost impossible. If you do, we're talking showers, we're talking change of clothes sometimes very invasive swabbing, and sometimes a documented abstinence that you haven't been near a chicken before. And in doing so, we can let you in sometimes. The reason for that is we've had some very significant zoonotic diseases with animals, and like in the swine industry, in the beef industry, we've had BSE. And in the poultry industry, we have had avian influenza. And this picture really shows in 2004, the infrastructure it took to depopulate a poultry industry. And they went in with large tanks of CO2 to depopulate birds to prevent this um, disease from spreading. And because it was an influenza and there was risk of being transferred to people, a lot of work went into that and to the, into the education program and went with it. But this is why we, we have some concerns about animals raised outdoors because of the wild bird part. So animal welfare is also another deal. Countries that don't have to worry about human welfare really are the ones who are more focused on animal welfare. And I've seen parts of the world where animal welfare is not an issue because the human welfare is. But here in Canada, and particularly in North America, and also in the UK, we are now getting labeling on food products saying the animals are raised in a humane way. In Alberta, we are getting a lot more into animal welfare audits, where the commodity groups will actually audit how the animals are produced, and that will be labeled on the, on the food. So one of the other issues that we are dealing with is if selection isn't balanced, so if we have selection for one product, so form and function don't match, I already talked about breast muscles, uh, we can actually have situations happen where 
the overall fitness of birds can be, can be impacted. And one of the side effects we have of turkeys having big breast muscles is that turkeys do not naturally mate anymore. So all turkeys we buy now are artificially inseminated. The chicken industry clued into the fact that this isn't where they want to go, and they have now got slowed down on selection to the point that birds still mate naturally. We also have had in our history problems with leg problems, problems with cardiovascular system as shown here. But what we've done is slow down selection and also use feed restriction for parents or body weight control to make it so that they still lay eggs properly. So in closing, what do you think the future of poultry efficiency is going to look like? I'm showing you the same slide I showed you early on. And you can see that if we keep on going the way we're going, in 114 years, a chicken will hatch and go to market the very same day. <laughs> so what that will, that will mean is we will no, no longer have poultry barns. We will either have great big hatchery drawers and have them hatch and grow in the incubator drawers, or we'll have them grow on the truck on the way to the processing plant. So what do you think of that? Thank you.